Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to continue our discussion on the union with Christ. And if you remember last time, we discussed the first point up here, us in Christ. And uh, this is a pretty remarkable thing, that we are in Christ, Jesus. And there are so many verses I talk about, I didn't even get to all of them. Not that I tried, but there are that many that talk about us in Christ. And uh, really, just to sum up what it means that we are in Christ, is that everything that happens to Christ or any, everything that revolves around Christ or anything that has anything to do with Christ also has to do with us. Not because of who we are or not for our own sakes, but because we are in Christ. And so um, we saw it had to do with salvation, it had to do with our life, it had to do with what's coming in the future. And so it really was all encompassing about our relationship in Jesus Christ. But there's another dynamic to this relationship, this union with Christ, that we want to cover tonight. And this is Christ in us. So it's not just us in Christ, but it's Christ in us. Now, there's a logical conundrum if you want to try to figure that out. Because it's not just, Christ being in us is not just that we are sharing his ideas or uphold his philosophies. It's not some... some uh, some symbolic, metaphorical uh, Christ in us. It is really, truly Christ, the divine Christ in us as a part of our salvation. And, and so if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, that's why I said it's, you know, it kind of defies logic, but um, God is not constrained by our logical reasons or the, the logic of the, uh, this physical world. And so, uh, so we have this relationship with Christ, that we are in Him, and that He also is in us. And what we want to do tonight is to just look at some of the, the, the verses that uh, describe the impact of Christ being in us. And this really, um, you know, I'm amazed when I consider that we are in Christ, but I'm equally amazed that Christ is in me. And just what that means for my life uh, is just... Uh, just really, really significant. So let's take a few moments tonight and we want to discuss this idea of Christ in us. So we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. And our first point is this, that Christ is in us as a result of faith. So we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Now, th this is not true of everybody, obviously. This is only true of believers. Christ is in us because we are believers in him. Because we have a relationship with Him. Now, and just as a side note here, it's not just Christ that is in us, but who else is in us of the Godhead? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us. So, uh, just to kind of clarify, when we're talking about Christ in us, we are not talking about the Spirit being in us. The Spirit is in us, and that's like a whole other study. We've spent some time on that in recent days, talking about the relationship of the Spirit of God. But we are talking about Jesus Christ in us. And so uh, we look at Ephesians chapter 3, and I want to start reading in verse 14. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, and our focal verse will be verse 17. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Notice the reference to the spirit of God there, right? We are strengthened with might through his Holy Spirit in the inner man. But then it goes on to verse 17. That Christ might may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And, and it's kind of interesting after what we're, we're seeing that the Spirit of God strengthens us in the inner man. And that Christ may dwell in us fully, that we are then, um, uh, what, yeah, that we are filled with the fullness of God at the end of verse 19. You see that there? So there's this connection that kind of runs through this passage here. And then we come to verse 20, which is kind of a popular verse. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works. Where? In us. 
So you, they all, you're familiar with that verse, right? He is able to do above more than we're able to, because his power is at work in us. So we have reference to the Spirit of God being within, within us, and that Christ dwells within us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a powerful passage that is. And uh, going back to verse 17, here's the part that has to do with Christ. Now, we come to our salvation by faith in the work of Christ, right? What did Jesus do? When we share the gospel, we talk about what he did, right? What did he do? He came to this earth as a man, and he proclaimed the kingdom of God, and he showed the power of the kingdom. And then at the end of three and a half years, he went to the cross, and on the cross he took... Sin. Our sins, and then he died paying the penalty, the penalty for our sins. And um, on the third day, he rose again. rose again from the dead in victory over sin and death. That's the gospel. That's what Christ did for us. And, um, and so we see in verse 17 that in relationship to this that we have with Christ, by faith or through faith, the, the goal is, or the result is, I should say, that Christ dwells in our hearts. In order that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend uh, this greatness of Christ and his love. So, by faith, and, and I think this is a reference to our salvation here, that Christ dwells in our hearts. Okay? So it's a result of our relationship to him. It's not applicable to everybody else, and I know that we know that. Um, it is only something for the true believer. We believe in Jesus, and he comes and he dwells in our hearts. All right? So it's uh, the result of faith, that Christ is in us. It's the result of our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ. So that's, a, that's the first part. The, the fact that he would come and dwell in our hearts, and that some of these things that are are uh, said in this passage would be true. It is um, an incredible place to begin. Let's turn to another passage, and this brings us to our second point here, that Christ in us is a proof of our relationship with Him. Christ in us, that He is there and present, that is a proof that we have a relationship with Him. Now, now this is just kind of um, obvious, right? If I don't have a relationship with Him, He's not going to be in me, right? But if I do have a relationship, then He ought to be there in me. And so that's what we're going to see in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And let me begin chapter 13 in verse 1. It says, This will be the third time I'm coming to see to coming to you. This is this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And that's just kind of an interesting way that Paul uses that right here. But anyway, well, that's not for tonight. <laughs> Verse 2, I have told you before, foretell as if I were present the second time, and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before, and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Now here it is, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now... The context here, Paul is trying to convey his, his genuineness, that he truly belongs to Christ, and that he has this, uh, this, this authority and responsibility to come and, and to, uh, to deal with them or you know, to, to speak with them. Uh, verse 3 he says, you seek proof of Christ speaking in me. So he's trying to convey, he's trying to convey that he is speaking by Christ. And he turns to this about whether or not Somebody is truly in him. And, and he gives these exhortations in verse 5. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. So this is something that we can do. We can examine ourselves in some way. We can, uh, we can uh, 
test ourselves in some way, examine ourselves in some way, to see if we are true believers, if Christ is in fact in us. Um, don't you know that if you're a true believer, that Jesus is in you? Right? Don't you know that? It, it's almost like it's, this is an obvious thing Paul is saying here. Now, I know the question is, well, it doesn't seem so obvious to me because it's not like I can just open up a door in my chest there and say, hey, Jesus, you know, if you, or, you know, knock, knock here, you know, hello. And just like in the Revelation where he says, I stand at the door and knock, you know, so we knock here to see if Jesus <laughs> is in there or not. Um, so this is, uh, well, he is saying it in such a, well, this is kind of an obvious thing. Uh, I know practically speaking for us, it's not so obvious. But the truth of the matter is this. If Christ Jesus is in your heart, you belong to him. And if he isn't, you don't. And so it becomes important to them to examine ourselves and to test ourselves to see if we are in the faith. And so this, this, begin, this, this becomes important for us. It is that Christ is in us is a proof of our relationship. Now, um, this opens up kind of a can of worms, you know, of this dynamic of our relationship to Jesus. Because here we are, we're all, we're all here tonight, and, and many of us have been coming to church for a long time, right? So what if I do this, and I test myself, and I discover, the best that I can tell, that Jesus is not in me, right? Now what do I do? Well, now it becomes important to make sure that I take care of that, right? But there's peer pressure in the church, isn't there? How many of you would really feel comfortable coming up to me and saying, Pastor, you know, I know I've been coming for 10 years to this church, but I'm just not sure if Christ is in me or not. That, that would be kind of hard, and I understand that. But we're talking about a genuine and sincere and true uh, relationship with Jesus. We're not here to play church, right? Yep. We're not here to play church. So this is not... The exhortation that I'm giving, this is Paul's exhortation to the church at Corinth to test yourself whether or not you are, uh, whether or not Christ is in, in you, uh, whether or not you are in the faith. So how do we tell? How do I test myself? And, um, and, I, and I think, um, I, I understand it's not easy, but, but there are some things that maybe we can look at with respect to ourselves. It's like, what do I love? What do I love, basically, in this world? I mean, do I care about what God says and what he thinks about things? Um, am I willing to change? Am I willing to repent of something in my life that isn't right? Am I willing to change, no matter how easy or hard that might be? Am I willing to change? Am I willing to put my thing, the things that are displeasing to God, am I willing to put those aside? Now, it's not always easy to put them aside, but do I hate the thing that is displeasing to God? Because obviously if it's displeasing to God, He doesn't care for it, and I shouldn't care for it. So um, sometimes, sometimes it's not easy to put those things aside, and we struggle and fight with it. But are we trying to? You know what I mean? Uh, are we trying to put them aside? Are we trying to make the change? Are we, are we repenting? Do we love the things that God loves? And what are some of those things that God loves? Do we love the things that God loves? What are some of those things that God loves? Patience. Okay, God. patience. Some of those, some of those uh, fruits of the Spirit, obviously, He wants to see in us. What else does He love? His Word. He loves His Word. He has given it to us. Obedience. Yes, our obedience is important to Him. Fellow, fellow man, my neighbor. Okay, my one another. Christians. Actually, I'm going to be talking about that on Sunday mornings. Did you know in the New Testament... There are a lot of one another statements. You, you've heard, have you heard? Has anybody ever heard that before? Anybody go through those one another statements? I'm going to take some time to, uh, to do that. And the reason is because um, our Christianity is really about other people. So we have a responsibility of a, you know, towards others. God loves us and we ought to love us too. <laughs> right? Okay, what else does God love? Okay, cheerful givers. God love the cheerful giver. All right, Tyson, say that louder. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Humility. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. So uh, we have an idea of the things that God yeah. loves. Yeah. So uh, God loves truth, and God loves love, and God loves, you know, all of these things. 
Uh, our kindness and gentleness and compassion. God loves uh, joy. These things belong to God. He loves these things. What are some things that God hates? <laughs> and then we can say sin, but uh, pride. Somebody said pride. Lust. The what? Lust. 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 Yeah, self idols. selfishness. Idols. idols, anything that we put up and that takes the place of Christ. <laughs> the what? Hypocrisy. Yes, hypocrisy. God hates hypocrisy. So, there are these things that God loves, and we ought to love the same things He loves. There are things that God hates, and we ought to hate the things that God hates. So that becomes, a, that becomes sort of a litmus test of our heart. And, and uh, we can judge a little bit you know, by looking at one another, because we can see the fruits of our uh, relationship to Him. Or you know, there should be some fruit visible uh, to one another, especially as we're working and ministering to one another. Um, but, but at the end of the day, you know, it's really what's going on in your heart and what's your relationship. Because there are things that we love that are in our heart that nobody knows about. That there are those secret things that we all have that other people just don't know because they can't see and, and we can keep them quiet. And, and, um, so, so what is it that's going on in your heart? How is your relationship to Christ? Test yourself. Read the Word of God and, and uh, take the things that it says and and uh, let it shine in your heart to expose the things that are not uh, pleasing to him and the things that are pleasing to him. Do you have secret closets that are full of skeletons? You know, those kinds of things. So we need to examine ourselves uh, because coming back, that Christ is in us. If he is in us, we belong to him. And if he is not in us, then we don't belong to him. And it doesn't matter how often we read the Bible or how often we pray, how often we go to church. If Christ is not in us, we are not his. If he is in us, then we are his. And so let us test ourselves. All right, the third, the third uh, point here of Christ in us. And, and this is kind of an exciting one, the ability to live right. And let's turn to Galatians chapter 2 for this one. As you can imagine... Um, when Jesus comes and takes residence in our heart, he doesn't, he doesn't just sit in the easy chair and kick up his legs and you know, take a snoozer there all day long. He is active at work, right? And so, uh, so this becomes an important one. And especially in the struggle that we have in this life. Because even though Christ has come into my life, I still have this flesh, right? And the flesh tends to keep going in the wrong direction. And, and we have to keep on you know, reining it in. Um, Paul says, I beat my body into subjection daily that I might not be disqualified. That's a pretty sober verse there. And, uh, and so there's still this tension between the, the pull of the flesh and the direction of the, and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so we, uh, we go through this life and there's kind of a battle. I mean, the Bible talks about three or four different kinds of <coughs> wars that we are in because of our our Christianity. So we fight. We're at war with the evil spirits around us, right? The devil and his minions. And we're at war with our flesh. And we're at war in our minds with the kinds of things that we um, think about. Now, there's another sermon series, right? The War of the Christian Life. Kevin? Have you ever read the Children's Project? I have. We're going to show it. They're coming out with a new... Um... I just watched a musical on it. Oh, it's a musical. <laughs> I haven't seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, we're going to be showing the Pilgrim's Progress when it comes out on DVD. We're going to rent it, or I think they had a free live stream, uh, but it's an hour and 45 minutes. So we decided that we would wait until it came out and then maybe split it between three, uh, over a three week period. But uh, if you've never read the Pilgrim's Progress, it's a classic. It was written by John Bunyan in the, the 13th century, I think. So it's, it's stayed around for quite some time. And, and it's a, an allegory of the Christian life. So he, he, kind, of, he kind of fleshes out some of the, the struggles and uh, what being a Christian is all about. So uh, Galatians chapter 2, our key verse will be verse 20. Let me start reading in verse uh, 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ 
and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. So here's talking about our salvation. It is not by works of the law. It is by faith in Christ, right? Okay. So verse 17, But if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we, are, uh, uh, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law, that I might live to God. And here's our verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now when it says, I, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, it's not talking about Christ taking residence in me, which is what we're talking about. It's talking about Christ being the active motivator of my life. In other words, I live, the things that I do in my life, I do by Christ. He is behind it all. And so, so this, I mean, this whole passage is about not, uh, not trying to be justified or to, to earn brownie points with God by keeping the law. It is by faith in Christ. Yet, the fact that He is in me uh, does impact how I live. So I'm living not to be saved. I'm living to please God. If I can say it that way. Right? And so I live a righteous life by faith in order to live for God the way that I should. And He is the one who strengthens me to do it. I live by Christ, or, or um, Christ lives in me. And what I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So He is the one who, who uh, gives me the power to do it. So here is, now I've shared this illustration before, but I read John Owen on the mortification of, of the flesh, and, and I, I think it wasn't too long ago that I shared this, but um, let me do it again. Um, I was, I went to that book, and he wrote in the 16th century. He was one of, kind of a Puritan, one of the Puritan writers, and I was expecting, you know, the practical steps, how to overcome sin in our lives, because that's a, this is, that's a real, that's a real Important issue, right? Because, you know, as a pastor, we're, I, we're all dealing with it here in the church. So how do I help the people? And um, the thing that stood out the most was that uh, he said he would, so believe it. It is by faith. You want to overcome? It is by faith. It's by faith in Christ that he will give you the power. He said he'd give you the power, so do we believe it now? And am I going to live by that faith in him? So that was like, whoa, you know, ding. You know, I, I, can, I can come up with 10 steps for overcoming sin, but unless Christ is doing it, I'm not going to be successful in it. And so there's an element of faith in which I allow him to empower me to live right. Because I can't do it any better than before I was saved without his help. I require his help now. And just as much as ever, because this flesh just cannot do it. I need him to do it. And he is there to do it for us. That's the good news about it. He is there. And there's, you don't have to fill out an application, and you don't have to you know, make sure you're qualified first. If you are a believer, he is present in your life. He lives in there, in, in you. And he, he uh, gives you the strength to live the life that he wants you to live. Praise the Lord. So now we have to... Uh, trust that he will do that for me instead of fighting to try to do it myself. And learning that is a spiritual mature, uh, it's a spiritual maturity thing. It's like how far along are we in our Christian walk? How, how much have we learned about Christ and following him and yielding to his spirit and allowing him to work through our lives? Where are we in that? And again, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church and all of these things. Um, 
have, have we grown in our faith? That's what matters. Sometimes you, sometimes a person becomes a Christian and they grow really fast in their trust and faith in the Lord. Other times, somebody accepts Christ and it just takes a whole long time and they don't really make any progress anywhere. And there's no judgment one way or the other. It's uh, The question is put to us right here, right now, as it is every day. Are we learning to trust Him more? Am I growing in my faith? Is my faith stronger today than it was yesterday? So hopefully you know, we can answer yes, and we can uh, grow in our walk with the Lord. He is there to strengthen us and to help us in this life. Let's go on to the next verse. Some of these are related, like this one. So let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 8 this time. And the next point is this, that Christ in us means the death of sin. Christ in us means the death of sin. Now we're going to be in uh, Romans chapter 8. And I'll start reading in verse 1. Now at the end of, verse, at, at the end of Romans 7, Paul talks about this struggle. Maybe I should uh, go ahead and read this. Let me start in verse um, in chapter 7, verse 18. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Let me, well, I'm just going to back up. Sorry. All right, so try to follow along here. Uh, I think chapter 7 is some, uh, some verses that we'll be able to relate to. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. But what, what I am doing, I do not understand. But what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. If then I do what I, what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells. For to will is present, that means the desire. The, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I want to do I do not do, but the evil I don't want to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I want, don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now notice twice he said that sin dwells in me. We're talking tonight about Christ dwelling in me. So the sin that dwells in me causes me to do what is wrong. That's what he's struggling with. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Now there's one of the, here's a reference to the, one of the wars that we fight. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you... The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give your life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. All right, so that was a pretty long passage there. And a lot of uh, deep stuff in this, in this passage. But it talks about sin being in you, and then when he comes to chapter 8, there's the good news. 
because he talks about the Spirit of God being in us, and then he talks about Christ being in us. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so Christ being in me means that there is the death of this sinful flesh that keeps taking me away from God, and there is life that comes by the Spirit of God. And so uh, we see the death of, of, uh, of this because of the presence of Christ in our life. All right, so that was a, that was a heavy hitting passage there, but an important one. Um, the Spirit of God is in us, Christ is in us, and we are free from sin. And that's what's important for us. And so it becomes uh, important that in our lives we reflect that. And we trust in his work through us to accomplish what he puts before us to do. So let's turn to John chapter 15 now. And our next point is that Christ in us results in fruit. John chapter 15, and it's kind of amazing here. I mean, Jesus told his disciples what it was going to be like. And we see one of those passages here. In verse 15, chapter 15 of John, the gospel, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. He prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are, are, you are already clean because of the words which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. Now, now there's, uh, there we have both the relationship. There. You see that? Abide in me, that's us in Christ, and uh, I in you, Christ in us. You, you put them both right there, one, one uh, simple sentence. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him, there he says it again, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. <clears throat> if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Now we see in verse 8 that God is pleased if we do what? If God, God is glorified if we do what? Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Bear much fruit. So that is his will for our lives. He wants us to bear much fruit. So there's another question you can ask yourself. Am I bearing much fruit? And if not, what can I do to start making this happen? And, and of course, you know, the heart of it is right here. I am the vine, verse 5, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So uh, this is not just talking about Christ in us, but it's talking about this oneness that we have with Jesus. Uh, we are in him, he is in us. We are abiding in him. If we do that, we will bear much fruit. And, and I think this, will, this kind of ties into what I was talking about on Sunday morning. That, uh, you know, we don't have, we want to bear much fruit. So then where do I start? Well, start with the one simple thing that's in front of you, right? Just start with that. And, and you'll see how God will just keep on giving you more and more things to do. And before you know it, you'll have just fruit everywhere. And, uh, and so that's how we want to be. Keep abiding in Him. He will put the opportunities in front of you. And as you take advantage of them, then uh, you, will, you will find that you are producing a lot of fruit in your Christian and that glorifies God. That glorifies God. That we bear much fruit. Alright, the next point here. Christ in us facilitates fellowship with Him. Let me read to you Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. That's our main verse here. Now this is... Uh, well, you can turn there. This is the message to one of the churches here in the book of Revelation. And... Uh, each of the churches, there's seven churches. I, I never cared for chapters two and three as a young Christian. 
Uh, they, they just seemed like, uh, this is boring, I want to get to the good stuff. <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of how I, I viewed it. And, and oftentimes I would skip chapters 2 and 3 just, just to get to the exciting stuff in the book of Revelation. But uh, I've come to, uh, I've grown significantly in my appreciation of chapters 2 and 3, especially as a pastor of a church. And uh, this kind of gives us a big picture of what the church is really like. And, and I don't think that anybody can really have an understanding of the church if they don't understand Revelations chapter 2 and 3. Because there are seven, diff seven churches here, and they are all different. They all have their good points, and they all have their bad points. And they all have their candlestick with the Lord. He threatens to take some of them away for sure, but he hasn't done that yet. And so the church is a multi-varied kind of thing, as we see in these two chapters. But anyway, that's a message for another day again. But in Revelation chapter 3, in uh, verse 20, he's uh, talking to the church of the Laodiceans. And verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and repent. Verse 20, and here's the verse that's so often used. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Now, now, now this is pretty amazing and, and here is the truth of it. However you want to apply it, he wants to come into our hearts. Right? He stands at the door and knocks and whoever opens the door he will come in. And you can link that to salvation maybe. Although the church, you know, would have had believers in it already. But, but I think it's the, it's the other part that's important here. I will come in to him and, what was the, what's the next word there? Eat. Yeah, eat or dine with him. And that's talking about a fellowship that we have with the Lord. So it's not just, it, um, whether or not it's talking about salvation, it is talking about this. If you open the door, he's going to come in and we have the opportunity to fellowship with Christ. We know that being a Christian is not just a religious thing. Right? And I'm a Christian. I call myself a Christian. That means I've got to go to a Christian church and I read the Christian Bible and I do the Christian things. We know that salvation is not that, right? Salvation is about a real and true personal relationship with a real person, right? That's what it's about. So uh, the next time you invite uh, somebody over to... Um, uh, eat with you, or the next time you go to eat with somebody, remember that there is a fellowship that Jesus wants to have with us. He is a real person. We have a real relationship with him, and he wants to fellowship with us. So he knocks at the door. If we open, he will come, and he will eat with us. He will dine with us. We will fellowship with him. And so we seek him in this way. And the last point, Christ in us gives us a hope of eternal life hope of eternal life. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 24. Verse 27 will be our main verse. Let me start reading in verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I have become a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, now here's the mystery that has been hidden from the past, but has now been revealed. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So here's the mystery. Christ in us. That, that, is, that is something that had, been, had not been seen before. That, that, was, that was veiled, if you will. But when Christ came, it was revealed. He comes in us. And that is our hope of glory. So we, we say if you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven. If you believe in Jesus, you'll have eternal life. 
Well, here it is. If you have Christ in you, you have that hope. That hope of uh, attaining to glory, of coming to glory. Because, if he is, because he is in you. That gives us our hope. And so it's, this, is, this is not a mental thing. This is, this is a, a truth thing, a faith thing. Our hope, this is not a wish list thing. This is, a, if, this is a, hope is something that you know will happen down the road. And faith is what carries us there. there there's no uncertainty about it. Like our world you know, uses the word hope. I hope I get better. That's kind of, I, you know, I'm wishing I'm going to get better. But I don't know if I'm going to or not. I, I hope everything is okay. That's like, there's uncertainty in that. That's how our world uses it. But when the Bible uses it, there is certainty. Christ in us is the hope of glory. It will happen. I'm just not there yet. And faith carries me there. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. The substance of things hoped for, Right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So hope is there. Faith is with me here. And, and I walk with faith towards my hope. Alright. So the hope of eternal life. The hope of glory. Christ in us. Any questions? Comments? Thoughts? Alright. It's quite a list there. And um, it's an exciting, it's a, an exciting thing. Christ is in us. Amen? So we can live for Him and give glory.